What's going on everybody? This is The Roaming Prepper and today I want to talk about fuel and gas prices going into the future. Um, you know, we're starting to see it's now August, well, end of July, we're almost in August, we're starting to see a little relief in those gas supplies as well as oil. Uh, natural gas has stayed high though. What I want to talk about is, is this going to continue or are we going to see more problems? Sadly, I think we stand a good chance, no guarantee, this is just looking at the numbers, looking at what I'm seeing, we stand a distinct chance of having another spike later in the year, possibly even energy shortages that could result in blackouts. Why is that? Well, I'm going to get into it in a few minutes. I'll be right back and let's talk about that. Welcome back everyone and thank you for coming to check out the video. As always, don't forget to like and subscribe. It does help my followership. And if you have a question after the video, I typically premiere these. If I can't get to you in the chat or I miss my own premiere, which due to work, it does happen. I will try to answer questions in the comments below. So what was I talking about? Gas prices are going down, but fuel prices are going down. But are they really? I'm afraid not. Let me explain why, and I'll get you some articles as well so we can talk about it. So as all of you know, due to the conflict in Eastern Europe, uh, a lot of the supply chain, which was already screwed up from, from the cootie, has now gotten more screwed up because of fighting, and that includes things like wheat, it includes things like oil exports, and part of the methodology that the West was using against Vladimir was to drop sanctions on his head. Um, among the sanctions were sanctions against fuels, oil, get natural gas, as well as his exports like wheat. What wound up happening though, is that these wheat exports, which were disrupted from the war in general, but were also sanctioned, wound up not feeding a lot of people. And what we saw was an, a lack of food. We were starting to see food shortages in a lot of countries. Uh, fuel prices took off, and um, as a result, we actually saw that domino into the smaller economies like, uh, and I've covered this before, like Ecuador, like uh, Nigeria, and and now we're, we saw Sri Lanka ran their president out largely because of inflation, Boris Johnson stepped down because they didn't like what he was doing. We're starting to see a lot of regime changes, and a lot of it has to do with the cost of living. People are under a lot of pressure right now. Um, after the lockdowns, they're now trying to get back to some semblance of, of civilization, and they can't because everything's too damn expensive. So what's been going on? Well, um, in theory, those uh, sanctions were supposed to punish Russia to where it would economically crush Russia enough to ru where the Russians would back off and say, okay, we're done. We're going to, we're going to stop. But that's not what happened. The West imposed sanctions, but other parts of the world like the East and the Middle East did not. They did not have to obey. It wasn't their war. It wasn't their fight. So Saudi, for instance, actually has doubled their Russian oil imports. Russians are selling their oil very cheaply on the market, and they can afford to do so. When you sell the oil that cheap, it's actually cheaper for Saudi to um, buy Russian oil to power their power plants, because their power plants are all oil and gas based, and then that frees up their oil supply, what they're producing in Saudi, to ship overseas at a higher price. Think about that. So here's the article from oh, Business Insider, just so you guys can have that little reference there. Oops, sorry, camera's the other side, duh. Um, Saudi Arabia more than doubled Russian oil imports in the second quarter to free up their own crude. So they're getting cheap Russian oil to power their country and then selling their crude at an elevated price because technically the Russian oil is not in the market because we in the West said so. And they're selling it back to us at a higher price. So when they say we're going to increase your pro the production or they're going to increase the availability of oil to Europe and the U.S., 
they're not producing more oil. They're buying Russia's oil cheap, powering their power plants with it, then selling their stuff to the market. So they're just adding their supply to the market, but it's still short. The market still contracted because the Russian oil was such a big portion of it. So you see with the game they're playing, um, they're making a killing and the Russians are still getting a bunch of money. And I promise you the Russians are selling it at profit. It's cheap to the Saudis, but the Russians are making money because they're producing it super cheap too. So our economic sanctions have done nothing. They're doing nothing. At least not what we think they were supposed to do. I'm sure they're doing something, but not what we thought they were supposed to do. Because China's buying the oil, India's buying the oil, and Saudi's buying the oil. The only people actually getting hurt are the people supporting Ukraine right now. Blows my mind, guys. Blows my mind. So why do I think this is going to affect us? Well, um, with that in mind, because Europe has been cutting back on the importation of Russian oil, they're now struggling to find a substitute. And uh, let me get you this article from Bloomberg. Paris faces an even colder, darker winter than Berlin. Um, France is more vul vulnerable than Germany to blackouts once the weather turns colder. There's your, oh, sorry, there we go again. Lefty syndrome. There's your article from Bloomberg.com. Why is that? Because Germany did not dismantle their nuclear power plants. They scaled them back. The Germans are great engineers. Everyone knows that. Okay, my damn carry pistol was made in Austria. The Austrians and Germans make great stuff. But they were smart. They're like, we'll, we'll shut them down or we'll spin the plants down to be green, but we're not going to destroy them or close them or whatever. And apparently France may have. And even if they didn't, Germany had more nuclear power plants than they did. So uh, that caused a lot of issues. So according to the article, and I'll read a little bit for you. In the European energy crisis, all of the attention is focused on Germany and gas from Russia. But France and it, its fleet of struggling nuclear reactors are at least as important. Indeed, the first European city to suffer blackouts as temperature drop toward the end of the year may well be Paris instead of Berlin. Now this is, remember, Bloomberg, whether you like the Bloomberg guy who ran for president is irrelevant, his business people call it like they see it. And so I kind of like this. As winter approaches, the outlook in France is increasingly dire. Uh, the state-owned facility is running only 26 of its 57 reactors with more than half of its chain undergoing emergency maintenance after the discovery of cracked pipes. With atomic reactors generating the lowest share of the country's power in 30 years, France faces an electricity waterloo. Um, ben the benchmark French one-year forward baseload power contract has surged to an all-time high. Let me see if I can make that bigger. All right, it won't let me do it, so I'm just going to have to kind of finagle it. But that line is pretty much, well, this line here, it's where we're supposed to be. Hold on, that's not doing it. Anyway, as you see, as we get into the middle of 2022, their, their costs are going up, and that's getting dropped on the people. You see where this is going to be a problem. And this is kind of making me crazy because it's like in the U.S., we have shale oil and gas, and that's expensive to produce, right? Because we have to frack. It's a lot of horsepower, a lot of chemicals, but it's prolific and it's effective and it's right here. Like we literally have enough of that plus the big solar farms, plus the wind farms, plus the new plants we have, not just in Texas, all over the U.S. We could do a all of the above methodology and pretty much make the U.S. of A and probably most of Canada energy independent. Like if US, Canada, and Mexico just kind of got on the same page, the whole North American continent, we'd be good. But we're playing this game and who's winning? So the president went to Saudi for all these puffy meetings and basically was told, well, eh. So uh, what have we learned so far? Well, we learned that Russian oil is still being sold. Uh, Vladimir is still getting money, and uh, yeah, the Europeans are going to be really screwed this winter, and possibly some Americans, but I think the Europeans more so than the Americans. So why do I feel we may see something worse come up? Well, the 30th meeting of OPEC, and that's OPEC.org, 
So that's the actual website for OPEC. The 30th OPEC and non-OPEC ministerial meeting will be held on the, uh, I believe it's the 3rd of August. I can't find it. That's awesome. Anyway, the 3rd of August, they're going to decide if they're going to increase production. Now, remember what I told you earlier, what Saudi was saying was, well, we'll increase supply, but what they're doing is buying Russian oil and then releasing their own to the market at an elevated price, right? That Technically, they're adding to the supply, but they're taking from Russia. Remember, it's a global market. So when Russia took their, got theirs kicked off the market, the, the available quantity got smaller, right? We're not adding to this. Right? Technically, the Russian oil's over here. What Saudi's doing is buying it on the side and then just throwing more in here, but the Russian oil's still off the market. It, 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 and again, it doesn't, it seems counterintuitive, but basically, the oil is physically there, right? It's somewhere in the universe, but it's not in the available market because of the sanctions that we put, we the West, put on the Russians during the war. So we basically shot ourselves in the foot. My fear is that. August 3rd, so we just had another three-quarter point hike from the Fed, right? The market's going up. The market likes to go up when the Fed makes an announcement. It freaks out for a minute, and then it goes up. Everyone's like, oh, okay, this is going to be no more, and then it happens again. One, I don't know if those rate hikes are going to do what the Fed wants it to do in the time they want to do it, right? I know what the Fed's doing. They're trying to cool down, take money off the market, make loans harder to get, and then each dollar, instead of, you know, your GDP is divided by dollars, each dollar's worth, it becomes more because you're taking dollars off the market, right? I don't know if it's going to work in the time they want it to, to not crater the economy, uh, but still tame inflation. I don't envy the position they're in. I kind of get, having read up on it a little more, I kind of get what they're going with it. I don't know how that's going to work, but... That would be a bad thing if Saudi and, and by the way, it's not OPEC, it's OPEC plus. Who's the plus? Russia. Think about that. So Russia's making a decision whether or not they want to alleviate the price of fuel for the countries that are sanctioning it. Let that think, sink in for a little bit. Where will this go? I don't know. Now, I could be wrong. They could say, hey, you know what? The global situation is really getting out of hand. We're going to increase production. They could surprise us. My fear is if they decide, mm, you know what? It sucks to suck, and all of you can bite me, and we're not going to increase production. We're going to have a problem in the West. Europe's, in particular, going to have a problem. Now, I have a buddy who, who lives in Europe, and he said the country's all over the map. So, like, um, Switzerland is not dependent because they get their fuel from somewhere else. Uh, Italy gets imports from Libya, which even though Libya is in the midst of a civil war, um, they're, you know, they're getting fuel from other countries in the Gulf, so they're right on the Mediterranean. Same with Spain. Spain's having more infrastructure issues like Texas had with the aging grid and whatnot. Um, but the UK, Germany, France, those guys are going to get hit hard. Um, if the fuel prices go the other way, and that's assuming there's availability. Again, it could get very convoluted. So what do we, what's our takeaway, right? I like to leave you with the takeaway. So our takeaway, you need to be thinking, not panicking, but thinking, if my power goes out during the winter and you live in a cold area, what are my options? Do I have a wood burning stove? Do I have an electric heater? Do I have a small generator? Do I have a jackery? Um, do I have a friend's house? Can me and my family, my extended circle, your mag, whatever the case may be, is there a place we can go where if like, okay, if Joe's family's power goes out, he can go to Mary's house, bring extra firewood and we'll, cause she has a wood burning stove. Okay, this is a good time to start planning those contingencies. Now, if you have the fuel, you have the generators, you have a jackery, uh, hell, I know a guy who actually built an electric windmill. He got one of those farm windmills you use for the water pump and put it on a tripod and uh, it didn't work very well but I get where he was going with it and I may need to go and see if I can make one a little bit better than his um and he's he's a pretty creative guy but he he did a few things wrong but anyway I get what he was doing he, and he's planning right he's like I'm gonna try and build this thing in case I need to charge and it's cloudy and my solar panel doesn't work well 
you know, there's always wind, so maybe I can charge my phones. You know, he's thinking, <clears throat> excuse me, so plan for that. Start planning those things now so you don't get whacked on the head later. Okay, so that's all I got for you today. Keep in mind, just because the price of stuff is going down doesn't mean it's going to stay there. There are a lot of moving parts. It could pan out. It could totally pan out, or you could get clobbered. Plan now. Again, the boxing analogy, roll with the punches, right? Don't just stand there and get hit flat-footed. At least you're moving. You know what's going on. You have some kind of maneuvering room, right? A little bit of cash if you need to run to a hotel because it gets really out of hand. Uh, that's an option. Make sure your fuel tanks and your vehicles are full. Uh, if you're storing gas, don't forget the stable uh, stabilizers. Um, I'm going to go this weekend. I got a couple of projects. One is going to be to double check my big propane tanks. I'm probably going to trade one in, even though they're expensive as shit now. Trade one in because it's kind of half and I'm not using them as much as I thought. Trade one in so I have a couple extra. Um, and I'll use them in the summer. I'll start grilling once the weather gets better. But I want to have those things in place now before everyone else realizes what's going on. So again, don't freak. The reason I bring these kind of things up is to inform you guys so you guys can make a decision that best works for you. You may, hell, you could even say, I don't have the money for a generator, but I know that if I go to Goodwill or I go to Walmart, I can buy a shit ton of blankets and fuzzy slippers and, and all sorts of pajamas that will keep us warm, even if it gets really cold outside in the house. And then buy candles so you have some light and some basic heat uh, and a propane grill so you can cook food, right? You can do this on the cheap or you can buy the bougie stuff, whatever, whatever works for you. If you can do both, even better. I got candles and I got the Jackery. You know what? The candles are way cheaper. I actually need more candles, but you get what I'm saying. So guys, learn, plan these things now. Learn how to set up your candles right. Uh, I actually have decor that also has a prepping purpose and I have to do a whole nother video on that to serve as light functions all around the house and storage, but it looks fancy. So when people walk in, they're like, wow, that's a nice little decorative piece, but it actually has a prepping purpose. Any case, that'll be another video for another day. Thank you for joining me today. Um, again, leave any questions or comments below. Uh, don't forget to like and subscribe if you wanna share, I'd appreciate it. And until next time, God bless, Godspeed, and I will see you all on the next video. Be good.